first is our deadline for admission to the master's program in data science. Uh, so many of the people here are already in the master's program in data science, but if you're uh, a prospective student, March 1st is the deadline. Um, so uh, it's time to get your application in. Um, let's see, a couple of other things. So certificates, we have uh, some certificate programs coming up. They're starting, um, they're all starting right around that week of March uh, 18th. So we've got uh, a certificate program in um, data science for product managers. We've got one in SQL, and we've got another one in deep learning. That's part two. So there's space in all of those. If you want to go online to the Data Institute, you can register for those certificate programs. Um, and the last announcement is the conference. So the Data Institute uh, conference is happening, and that's going to be uh, March 10th. And there's actually one other announcement. Uh, so the Data Institute conference on March 10th, and then for those, if, if there are any prospective students around, um, we do actually have an info session happening today after seminar. So there'll be an info session at 2 o'clock, so you can stick around for that too. All right, I think that's it. All business taken care of. Great. Uh, so now uh, on to the main event. So we're super excited to have um, Katie Huang here uh, she's from, from Workday, and she's going to talk to us about um, Candidate rediscovery. Candidate rediscovery. <laughs> <laughs> Is it here? Yes. Hello? Click it. Click this one? This like little oh, button? Yeah. Oh. I see. <laughs> oh, okay. Give me one second, guys. Thanks. All right, shall we, shall we get started? Um, thank you for coming today in the rain. I heard that it started raining. Um, I see some of my colleagues here. So I've actually given this talk like was in work day once. So pretend you're not bored. Um, I'm going to, so I'm a data scientist, um, Katie Huang at Workday. Um, I'm going to tell you a project we're doing called Candidates Rediscovery. So let's get into it. Um, I would like to review the safe harbor statement with you guys. If you guys don't know what this is, this is pretty much just a disclaimer that says the topic I'm presenting today is kind of like work in progress. There's like no guarantee it might be marketed um, two days, well, like two years down the road. And so I think for the crowd today, everyone's doing data science, it should be pretty self-explanatory. So. And the agenda, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then we're going to jump into candidate rediscovery, the problem statement, or the use case. Um, and then we're going to get into the meaty part, which is machine learning's pipeline. I'll tell you how we do, you know, all the way from input data to getting results. And obviously, we're going to evaluate it, reflect on whether it's a go or not go. Um, in the very end, I have people um, ask me things like this before, so I added like one slide that tells you the ML process at Workday. We kind of have like a standard procedure how we do things, and so I'm gonna give you a glimpse of that. So a little bit about me, I'm pretty old. Um, I have a master's degree in biostatistics. I graduated in 2010. So um, I actually didn't start um, in the tech industry right after I graduated. I was in the survey business. So it's a very niche area. Um, 
I was like a quantitative specialist for survey operations. So like when you're doing survey, not analyzing the survey results, but when you're doing survey, there's a lot of like timeline, um, there's a lot of like sampling, how you design the samples at a national level. And so I was using quantitative methods to do that. And so that sounds data science-y enough. And thought, so I decided I wanted to move into the tech industry in 2016. Um, so we moved to the West Coast and the first company I joined is a startup called Retail Solutions. Um, we do a lot of like out of stock predictions, um, like what you're going to say on ne tomorrow or next week, that kind of stuff. Um, that's when I kind of realized that, great, I have a lot of like statistics knowledge, but I don't know a lot about, you know, like coding or time complexity or like, you know, just computer science and software engineering in general. And so I decided to go to a data science boot camp called Metis. It's actually like 10 blocks away from here. Um, I know you guys are master's students, so it probably doesn't apply to you, but I really like the boot camp experience. If you have questions or are curious about it, you can ask me later on. Um, and so after I graduated, I joined Workday as a data scientist. Um, I have been there for one and a half years and I kind of like it. We do a lot of like unstructured data. Um, so the project I'm going to tell you today is kind of under that realm. We look at a lot of, you know, like your resumes compared to this job requisition. And by requisition, I just mean like job description you'll see on career sites. That kind of thing, we also match a lot of different things. And so it's all like text blobs, unstructured, um, that requires a lot of NLP, nat uh, natural language processing. So let's jump into candidate rediscovery. So this is kind of a template for how recruiters are gonna reject you. <laughs> um, Diane told me that a lot of you guys are probably going to look for jobs or internships soon. Is that right? Yeah, so get used to it. Um, <laughs> basically, so what this is saying is that, so we're really sorry we have filled the current position, but your skill set is actually pretty good. We're going to keep you on the file and then we're going to reach out to you in the future. Now, why do they say that? It turns out that a lot of companies, especially like bigger companies, they try to hire for the same skill set again and again. So like if they're hiring for Java engineer last year, they probably need another one for another department, maybe next year, maybe this year. Um, so that's why they say, you know, for similar future openings, we're probably going to reach out to you. But the reality is they usually don't. Um, <laughs> the, the, the reason is that, so it turns out that talent acquisition is actually kind of a tough business to be in um, from a lot of like people we interviewed and do like use case studies with. We heard, most of the things we heard is that the recruiters actually don't have access to previous applied candidates. And so maybe your file or your resume is sitting there, um, but no one knows where it is. And so that is why Candidate rediscovery is being proposed right now. Um, we propose that we're going to use machine learning to give you a product that says we will, we will like surface selected past candidates. And so if you're a candidate that's been vetted before, but for some reason you're still active, which means that you haven't found a job, you're probably still looking, then they can reach out to you. And we're going to do that across the company so that department A can communicate with department B and see if they already have some good candidates. So that saves time. Like you don't have to go through, you know, looking at resumes from scratch. And there's not going to be complex queries that a recruiter has to do. Not everyone is tech savvy. And so we're going to do that with machine learning. Let's dive into the back end a little bit more. So let's frame the problem. The problem is that if today you have a new job opening, uh, we call it job rec, which is job requisition, all the recruiter wants to see is can you give me a very short list of candidates that's relevant. Um, so we're highlighting not only relevant but also top pass candidates because of the rediscovery part. We want to 
get the candidates that already applied before. So this is kind of drilling down to how the back end works. Let's look at the orange blob on the left hand side first. Let's say today you have a new job requisition. We're going to use machine learning. Specifically, we're going to use NLP to match old job requisitions that's very similar to the current one. So once that's matched, the rest is not machine learning. It is um, kind of how the candidate's database is set up. If you're like one of our Workday customers, then that's how your database is already going to be set up. So that part is not machine learning. Basically, every job requisition that's been worked on will have a list of candidates that apply to them, attached to it already. And so in the very end, you get to match the new job requisition to all of the past candidates. And we can filter it out by who already found a job, who doesn't have their resume updated for like two years, and so on and so forth. So this is how we propose a recruiter is going to see. It's just a JPEG file, so don't get too excited. Um, let's say you are filling for a marketing coordinator opening. Um, we want to say, OK, we don't want the recruiter to see like 200 resumes a week. We want to surface a pop-up window that says we are going to recommend, recommend candidates, for example, 10 candidates that's, that has like a high similarity matching score. If the similarity is not useful to the users, we can suppress it. But the idea is that how similar are they um, from the past job requisition to the new one. And then if people like it, they can click on it and then add it to their list of candidates they're going to reach out to and go from there. So it's a mock-up. All right, let's get into machine learning. So um, this is kind of like an overview of how things done. Um, we have input data. Input is pretty much just like one job description that you can see on any career website. It's like maybe two or three paragraphs, stuff like that. Um, Pre-processing, I'm going to tell you a few ways how we clean text. So for example, lower casing is one way to clean it. After that, we're going to go into feature extraction. Um, what feature extraction really means is just we're converting text to numbers because we can work on numbers, but it's hard to work on text. And so we can convert it to like something like a matrix, and then we can calculate distances. Um, after that, it's really just calculating distances. So we're going to find the nearest jobs out of all of the possible combinations. Um, up to this point, you're pretty much done. But I'm going to tell you how we do post-processing. So for example, if you want to further refine your results, you are able to do that. But it's not required. It's in our pipeline, and everything is configurable. That's the idea. Um, we're going to store the output and then do evaluation. Evaluation is very important for us because when we're prototyping, we're really just trying to work out ideas. Which idea is going to be marketable? Which idea is going to be you know, useful to people when we start selling it? And so evaluation is very important to inform the company. All right, let's go into pre-processing. Do we have any questions so far? All right, cool. Yeah, OK, so one of the very first thing we do when we get a text blob um, is to remove the boilerplate sentence. So what is a boilerplate sentence? You know, like in all of the job descriptions, you'll probably get like a template that says, oh, Workday is great. Please join us. We have health care. We're not going to work you over time. And so <laughs> that is the boilerplate. We don't think it's very informative when we're trying to find you know, matching, candi uh, matching candidates to similar job requisitions because it's just attached to everything. And so it, it's almost useless. Um, we're going to remove it with something called shingling. So just a quick illustration of what shingling means. Let's say you have two sentences. The first sentence is called, this is a rose. Um, and I want to use a shingle of two to break it down. And so my first shingle is going to be this is. And my second shingle is going to be is a. And then the third one, obviously, a rose. And so using this shingling technique, you can break down a very long sentence into like 
a bag or a set of shingles. And it's, it's really not that special. The, the reason why we're doing this is that it's an easier representation so that we can start calculating, okay, between two sentences, what is their union, what is their in, uh, intercept, stuff like that. And from there, you can do Jakar similarity or calculate some other kind of distances. Now the problem with Jakar similarity is that if you're gonna com compute all of the possible combinations, that's gonna take n squared time. So we don't want that. We came up with, well not came up with, we found a already existing uh, method. Um, it's a two-step hashing method. Uh, the first step is called minhash, the second step is called LSH, that's, that stands for locality sensitive hashing. And so using that, we are able to hash all of the possible sentences into like different buckets. So if you look on the right hand side, just pretend the orange blob is like a lot of different buckets. And so every sentence can be hashed to like a different place in, in the bucket. Now, why do we want to do that? So we're functioning under the like assumption that if a sentence is a boilerplate, then it happens very often. So like the frequency is high. Based on that, if the bucket is big, we know the frequency is high, then we're gonna assume that, okay, more, more likely than not, it's gonna be a boilerplate. And so using that, we're just gonna, just gonna have like a configuration, like a cutoff, and say, oh, if the bucket is so big, we're just gonna remove it completely. And that boilerplate sentence is never gonna go into our further pipeline for analysis. All right, let's look at another pre-processing technique. Well, two of them. One is called sanitization and one is called either stemming or lamentization. How many of you have, have like worked, on, worked on these techniques before? Oh, cool. So I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so sanitization, it's actually kind of a creative process. Uh, we're doing a lot of like, removing redundant like white spaces, lower casing, removing dashes, so on and so forth. Just to give you an example, um, I'm assuming most of the people here are using Python. So this is just a Python, kind of like a regex we came up with. Um, specifically for this one, we found a lot of like dashes before and after like a requisition ID. ID really doesn't mean too much to me. Um, it's just like a, you know, encrypted thing that you have to remove. Um, so we're removing that, but at the same time, there are like legit dashes. For example, time dash sensitive. That is like one legit word and we don't want to remove that. And so regex can easily like differentiate these two and then output the cleanup text. Now stemming, um, since so many people have raised their hands, I'm just gonna run through it. Um, stemming is pretty much, it, there's a lot of word variations that stands for the same word meaning and so we're just gonna like truncate the end. Now that doesn't always work. For example, better gets truncated to bet. So we're using lamentization. Um, what we're using for this project is a pre-trained lamentization model called WordNet. Um, Pre-trained is really good for us. We don't have to do things from scratch and then we can like fast prototype. And so that, that's a good idea. Um, for lamentization, you can have more sophisticated ways to link words to their root words. So for example, better is linked to good. That stemming cannot do. All right, so now our text blob is pretty much nice and clean. We're gonna go into feature extraction. So remember what I said, feature extraction is just um, converting text into numbers or like a matrix more likely. Um, there are a few different ways that we're trying. Um, it's all configurable. You can choose which one you wanna use. I'm gonna introduce three of them to you. How many of you have used TFIDF? Cool. <laughs> You probably have some courses on that. And how many of you have done word to vec <laughs> All of you guys, doc to vec Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. doc to vec is kind of like a variation I can talk to you about. Um, so let's run through TFIDF. 
TF-IDF, it's the kind of like a trade-off between term frequency and document frequency. And so if things happen in the document so often, like the, and, the, of, that kind of stuff, then you really want to weigh it down because they're not useful. And then in the end, what you're going to come up with is a matrix for your entire input data. So your roles are going to be, each row is one document. So for us, that's one like job description. And then your columns are going to be individual words. So for example, if you have all of the words in your training data, like in the dictionary, then the dimension is going to be really high. So later on, we're going to talk about like how to do dimension reduction. All right, but like coming back to feature extraction, this is the second way to do it. Um, have you guys been using like pre-trained word to vec or are you training your own? Pre-trained, pre yeah. Um, us too. <laughs> it's, it's really easy to do that. And then um, basically, okay, I want to show you, I want to refresh your memory on like the architecture because doc to vec we're going to talk about a similar architecture. So specifically what I'm showing you is Siebel. Um, we have three layers. The first layer is input and then the third layer is output. We're using the previous words to predict the next word. We're good so far? And then we have one hidden layer. So what we really care about is not the output but the weighting in between the input and the hidden layer. Good so far? All right, and all of the words are gonna be coded in one hot encoding. All right, this is all you need to know. Um, so there are actually a lot of different variations of word to vec. I'm gonna show you three of them because we're using all of them in our pipeline. The first one is kind of like the OG, um, trained by Google using Google News. If you don't know what it is, you can Google it. No pun intended. Um, the second one is Fast Text. Um, it's trained by Facebook. It's interesting because I, th I think they're doing like sub word training, which means that they can catch some spelling errors. So that's a fun part of it. And then the third one is Glove, trained by Stanford. Um, I believe it's not done in Python, um, but Python has a wrapper for it. It's, I think it's written in C or C++. Yeah, I don't quite remember, but um, that one is a little bit different. It's uh, looking at co-currency, so it's literally looking at like contingency tables. Like whenever I imagine it as contingency tables, and then you have like two words happening together, then it means that maybe semantically they're pretty similar. So that's, that's that method. Um, so now here is the caveat. Now we have converted one word to one vector. Within each document, we have so many words. What are we going to do to aggregate them? So it turns out that a lot of people do it in a lot of different ways. Um, the most popular thing is to take the average. You can also do like a summation, stuff like that. Um, but in our pipeline, we're trying two different ways of taking the average. Um, one is do a TF-IDF weighted average. So like now that we have every word is a vector, we're going to weigh it by the TF-IDF weights and then aggregate them and then take the mean. Um, smooth inverse frequency is actually a very similar idea. Like the intuition is all the same. We're trying to like weigh up important words and weigh down, you know, unimportant words. And so SIF is another way to do weighting and then take the average. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to the third way to do um, converting text blob to numbers, and it's called doc to vec. So by the name of it, we're converting one document to one vector in one shot. So we're not going to look at individual words. We're just going to do, okay, I have this job requisition. Can I convert it into one fixed length um, array? Um, so the way they're doing it is actually very similar to word, uh, word to vec. Yeah. So the only difference is that orange part. We're adding one more set of input. Let's say you have you have a hundred paragraphs, and by paragraph I mean you have a hundred 
uh, job requisitions. And so you're going to one hot encode that into like a hundred dimension paragraph ID. And so you're going to add that into your input data. So now you're basically using more features to predict the same outcome. Um, so it's pretty simple. It's the same. You're going to slide through your sentences attached with the same paragraph ID and predict the next word until you exhaust the, the like paragraph. And then you're going to go on to the next paragraph. For us, it's the next job requisition and so on and so forth. So what this is doing is that, um, again, you're not like really looking at the output, you're looking at the trained weighted vectors of that paragraph ID. So it's going to come out in between the input data and the hidden layer. Alrighty. Oh, that's the only slide. So let me go back and tell you a little bit more. And so um, basically we don't have pre-trained data for that. I think it's pretty obvious because every single paragraph is so unique. And so for us to train Doc2Vec, you always have to train from scratch. And it has worked out pretty well. Um, I think my only complaint is that the, the um, hyperparameter is a little bit hard to train. Um, but you just have to look at it and do grid search or something like that. All right, so now we have converted all of the text into numbers. There is another thing we can do. Um, that is dimension reduction. So we have tried um, different ways of doing it, you know, like PCA, SVD. Truncated SVD runs faster than the normal SVD because it's truncated and it's like iterative. Um, it's sometimes called LSA. So basically it's just different ways to do dimension reduction to like reduce, you can say it's reduced noise or you can say it's like make it go faster. Um, it serves both purposes. And so, for example, say you configure it to be um, like conserving 80% of the variance, then maybe you'll be able to reduce the dimension up from more than 5,000 down to 800. Um, it's very interesting. When we were doing this project, we realized that dimension reduction didn't work so well. Um, in hindsight, we think it's because the job requisition are always phrased in a very specific way. And actually different recruiters copy and paste from each other. <laughs> yeah. So um, what, what word to vec is very good at is that they can find the semantic meaning behind different paraphrasing. Unfortunately, that's just not the case for our, for our project because we always phrase it the same way. And so dimension reduction actually doesn't reduce that much noise for us. It actually reduces useful information for us. So really be careful about what your use case is. It's always different. Now that we're pretty much done, the last step we need to do is just surface the nearest jobs. So let's say we have a new query coming in. This is like a new job that we're trying to fill. So it's on the left-hand side we can literally um, calculate the cosine distance from it to all of the previous job we have in our database. And so you'll have like a long list of distances attached to all of the old jobs and we can sort it. So when you look at the bottom, it is sorted. For example, the second job rec is the closest to a new one. The first one is the second closest and so on and so forth. All right, but just like all of the search engines, we're not going to surface every single thing. We're going to surface, say, like the top three, the top 100. That's how it works. Um, we don't want to show everyone everything. And so the way we're doing it is um, we came up with kind of like a smart cutoff algorithm. And if you look at the plot here, so let's say this thick blue line is kind of your sorted distance. So every job requisition has a distance and the distance goes higher when you go to the right hand tail because it's sorted. Now, if you look at the red thing, that's the slope. If you take the first derivative, you will see the slope. That's how the distances are changing across the sorted job requisitions. Now, what is the second derivative? The second derivative is saying, how much are the slopes changing? So the change of the change, basically. And um, let's say the peak 
is between the seventh and the eighth job, job requisition. What that means in like a layman language is that between the seventh and the eighth job requisition, the distance have jumped up so much. And so we think maybe that's a good way to cut it off because maybe the ace one has such a long distance, it's no longer re relevant. So for this example I'm showing you, we're cutting off at the top 10. And it's dynamic. Okay, so we're pretty much done. Do we have any questions so far? Good. Moving on to post-processing. So, like I said, you're pretty much done, but if we want to refine our results, there are a lot of different ways to do that. Um, some of the things we're experimenting with is we're using a Workday internal tool called Query Intent. Um, what Query Intent is doing for you is that, for example, I type in Java engineer at San Francisco. Then Query Intent is gonna show you the intent. So Java is a skill. We're gonna label it as a skill. And then engineer is going to be a job title. And then San Francisco is going to be the location. Now using that, for example, if I'm just going to focus on location, then I can use that to filter out all the people who apply that's maybe in London, in South Korea, somewhere else. So if I say originally I have three results that's tied to the job engineer at San Francisco, then I'm gonna cross out the second one because this one is so far. And then the third one is at Pleasanton. So Pleasanton is actually Workday's headquarter and it's like roughly one hour away from San Francisco from here. And so we figure, okay, maybe we can keep that one. So that's pretty much what we've been doing with fast prototyping. Um, I'm gonna show you a few evaluations. Unfortunately, I cannot show you real data because it's confidential. Um, but so I want to tell you two main points. One is qualitative evaluation is very important. We actually try to emphasize how much we want to do qualitative um, user interviews and show them results, ask them to eyeball it, and tell us what works for them, what doesn't because this is early on, this project is like an exploration. Even though we're data scientists, not everything has to do with numbers. And so talking to users, talking to, for example, in our case, we're talking to hiring managers, we're talking to you know, recruiters, and ask them, what do you need? That is so much more informative than like running numbers. And so we got a lot of information out of it. For example, the location filter is one thing that our user told us. Um, the boilerplate removal is one thing they told us. And so we incorporated that in a quantitative way into our project. And so that being said, we have quantitative methods to do evaluations. And so one very important thing and, and one very popular matrix is um, NDCG. So that stands for normalized discounted cumulative gain. Um, I don't know if you guys do that, but it's pretty popular in like search engines. You're pretty much ranking how good your results are. Um, and obviously we also do recall and precision. That's kind of like the standardized, you know, we, if we use scikit-learn, we know that that's pretty standardized. You can do F1, combine it together. All right, and I want to kind of have a discussion with you guys of how people can work together to code up kind of like a POC, a prototype. Um, for us, we use Python, but we have the question of whether we want to use it in Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab, or if we want to do in regular Python. So like some people are more comfortable in like PyCharm, IntelliJ. So how do you decide? Um, Jupyter Notebook is kind of like very good for knowledge sharing. If you're the sole developer in this team, I would actually recommend Jupyter Notebook because you can do markdown, you can share your results across like technical, non-technical, you know, project, um, users, managers, and you can do a lot of visualization. Um, but on the other hand, so for example, my project, this, this project, we have three data scientists. 
And so we figure we want to do things in PyCharm because you can modularize code. People can share, you know, like your classes or your uh, functions across each other. We have gotten to a point where our code is more mature now and we want to just like tweak the configuration and see what works. And so doing it in regular Python will give you more like a streamlined ability and you can do code review. And so the, the conclusion is that it really depends on you. We don't have a good answer either. Now the last thing I'm gonna talk about, I think this is only one slide. So at Workday, we have a standardized procedure to do machine learning. This is zooming out from one single project. So every single project goes through something like a funnel. Um, as you can imagine, in the beginning of the funnel, we have like a wide opening, we have a lot of ideas, we don't know which one is gonna work. And so that goes into the blue graph. Um, we have the ideation and exploration phase. Mostly data scientists and project managers are gonna be you know, involved in this phase. Um, and then some of them work out. And so we'll go into the blue one, which is design and productization. So now we get more engineers to get involved in this. We want to write productionized code. We want to start thinking how to package it and have it run repeatedly and run across tenants. Um, by tenants, I just means that we have different customers. So we want to run the same thing for different customers. And after things are selling, we go into support and maintenance. Um, for data scientists, we need to be involved because there's a lot of like retraining and then maybe we'll get new labels. And so then our model is gonna be retrained with like a better accuracy. So all that said, the current project I told you today is in the ideation phase. So we're pretty early on. Um, mostly today, I just want to show you how things could be done. This is not the only way that we can do machine learning pipeline, but we have been doing that and we think it's been working pretty well. And so I hope you can walk away today and say, okay, now I know that people are doing that in the industry. Lastly, we are hiring. So if you're interested, feel free to like take a photo of the, the URL if you want. Um, we're hiring across all of the spectrums. So from data science side to more like uh, system engineering side, whichever you're interested in, we probably have a position for you. We're also hiring for internships. Um, the two links here, the top one is specifically for university new grads. Um, if you're looking for your first full-time job or if you're looking for internships, you can go to the first link. The second one is more of like a general our workday career website and so feel free to go to either. Yeah, sure. So the question is, can you talk about the difference between all of these positions? Um, so data science is a very young field. I, I want to preface by saying that every company is going to define it differently. Um, for Workday, data science is more like people like me. I have a biostatistic degree and I do more prototyping. I look at the algorithm itself. Machine learning, um, machine learning engineer is kind of like um, I will think of this person as they are able to understand basic machine learning algorithm. They can use the API, but at the same time, they know how to like say, talk to different ports. They know how to tweak the configuration in um, AWS. And then they'll do a little bit of DevOps things, um, if you will, DevOps and system engineering. Um, the third one, Nash, uh, NLP specialist, that's just because Workday has a lot of, you know, unstructured data with like text blobs, people's resume, people's annual reviews, so on and so forth. So we specifically are looking for people who are interested in natural language. And system engineers and uh, DevOps people, they're going to have an interest in machine learning, but they mostly are going to build systems for machine learning products. Is that good? Alrighty. And that is my last slide. Uh, yes.
Mm-hmm. Do you consider maybe the class candidates can drop out for Section 1 more important than the others? Or do you equally just get the whole full class all the same as well? Yeah, so um, the question is, I guess your question is kind of like, does the ranking of the result matters? Yeah. So yes, it definitely does. Um, there's a caveat because sometimes you're hiring for exactly the same position and then you can see the job description is completely copy and pasted. Um, only the job requisition ID is different. In that case, the ranking will be tied. Yeah, but yes, the ranking does matter. How are our other <laughs> models that's not NLP working, basically? So we haven't done that. Okay. Um, what I show you today is mostly what we have done so far with the pipeline. And so, you know, like TFIDF, stuff like that, I would consider them NLP. I'm guessing what you're thinking of is kind of like, okay, random forest model, gradient boosting. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, I mean Mm -hmm. could be like built into the background in terms of like what's going to happen to that task to the job application. Okay, so I'm not very sure if I can answer that question, but let me say um, you are going to get a set of features that's derived from like NLP methods. You're also going to get other sets of features that's probably numeric starting from the get-go. It's not NLP in nature. So there are a few different ways you can do it. Number one, just concatenate it. Concatenate it, feed everything into a sophisticated model, you will probably get good results. If that's too messy, then you can do dimension reduction on high dimensional features. Most likely it will be NLP, so you do dimension reduction on NLP and then concatenate it with other features and see if that works. Now that everything is gonna be converted into a matrix or number at some point, and so it really doesn't matter whether it's coming from NLP or not, you can fit any model that fits the use case. So there is no differentiation at that point. And performance isn't an issue? Um, so for performance, I can't really speak of that because in our current pipeline, we're not looking at things other than what I just show you. But performance shouldn't be an issue when you have like the right architecture and the right time complexity, yeah. So it's not really about NLP or not. It's about are you using the right model for your use case in general. I hope that answers it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, um, once you have your matrix, um, is it basically in Eric's neighbors with a Jakar distance? Um, you don't have to do Jakar distance. Um, that could be one way to go, but to use Jakar distance, you don't even need to convert text into, into numbers. And so what we're doing is that we tried a few different, so the best thing that worked for us is cosine distance. Um, we also try Euclidean distance, um, but you have to normalize it for it to make more sense. Um, I think we also tried Mahalonobis. I don't remember how that went because it probably didn't go well, so I don't remember <laughs> it. But yeah, there, there are a lot of different ways you can calculate distance that um, what I showed you is not an exhausted list. I guess the follow-on question is, in production, you would have to search over N, which would be like um, pretty large for you guys, right? So are you filtering, uh, or is that something you're processing in the query model? Yeah, that's a smart question. Um, we've been, so now that it's, more likely it's gonna go into production. We've been trying to research how to do like KD trees, stuff like that. So we're gonna index it. We're gonna index it in a way that when we do retrieval or like when we calculate the distance, we're only calculating it for a subset. Another way to do it is you just calculate all of the distance overnight and then it will just sit there being indexed. And then when we're doing retrieval, it's not even in a calculation, it's just retrieval. So there, yeah, there are different ways to do it. You can also do clustering, 
um, you can cluster and then only retrieve and calculate the distance within the same, you know, cluster. Yeah. Yes. Oh, hi! <laughs> Which year? Um, 2016. Oh, so uh, young. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, how are the resume stored in your data set? Like, the, from the past candidates? Um, so, uh, that's a good question. I actually don't know how it's stored in production. Um, that's from another team. Um, when we get production data, it's all going to be kind of like in a JSON format. And so, for example, you'll have an ID or a worker or like a job description ID that's attached to it. And then the value is going to be, you know, like a text blob in our case. Um, however, so that being said, what I'm using here is standalone files because we are, what we're doing is we're partnering, partnering in up with like early adapters and so we're going to talk to them a lot and then we're going to ask for you know like new data we can think of new data they're able to provide to us and so it's all standalone it's a very collaborative process in the very early on stage so two different ways Um, so we get one standalone file, like if you, if you think about it, so sometimes we get CVS, sometimes we get JSON, um, but no matter what format you get, we're trying to have everyone upload to like our AWS um, environment so that it's all like, you know, confidential, and then we'll download from there. Um, so the format, the, the format is very, it, it's varied because it depends on what our early design partners give us. Um, when you go into production, most likely it's going to be JSON. Um, one thing we're doing is that in between, in between the entire pipeline, we have like checkpoints. And so we'll probably save like um, pickled files. And that's another, that's another way of doing input. We're just going to read in pickled files that we have from before, otherwise it's just gonna run forever. But back to your question, I think the answer is it varies. You have a question? All right, can I find it? Where are you talking about Doctivec? There's no waiting for, for Doctivec. Basically, after things are trained, you're getting one vector for each document already. It's like a very one-shot process. That's why we like it. Uh, say it again. I elaborate a little bit more. The input, so for example, your first document, um, in this case, we're calling it paragraphs. Let's say your first paragraph is called the cat sat on the porch. Now, what you're going to do is that your first data point is going to have paragraph ID equal to one in, in a one hot encoded way. And then the other sets of input is going to be one hot encoded the cat sat and then your output you're going to predict on. Now your second data point is going to have a sliding window. And so your second data point is going to be the same, paragraph ID equals to one. That doesn't change. But now you're going to predict, use cat sat on to predict the. And then your third data point is going to be paragraph ID equals to one. And then the other input is going to be sat on the to predict porch. Does that, does that make more sense? You're predicting the probability of the next word being a certain Yes, it's exactly the same as a word to vec. You're predicting the probability of the next word. 
yeah, you're just adding one more set of feature, which is the one hot encoded paragraph ID. Yeah. Can you limit three words or is that just for the example? Yeah, it, um, so the question is do you limit three words? That's just for the example. You can do whatever you want. And this is just like one way to do it. You can also do it like the skip gram way, which means that you're using the first word to predict the second to the fourth word. So there are a lot of ways to do it. And there's, yeah, that, that paper, if you're interested, look at that paper. That's, that's what we all look at. And they have some cool diagrams. All right, well, let's thank you again. Thanks. Cool. Thanks.